lock. That is available to us, right? When I say single lock, meaning that either you can use it for a single global variable, or you can use it for any particular resource. For example, if you are using an Ethernet port between multiple processes, right? Which process will access that Ethernet port? How do you determine that? Right? So you use Duplex lock. So within a process is able to acquire a lock. That is the process who will be getting the access to that, right? So in order to use mutex, uh, first, you know, generally for any global uh, variable that we want to use, we have to do the initialization, right? So for mutex also, uh, there is an initialization uh, function that we will have to execute. It has mutex, mutex in it. And then this is the type of mutex data. So whenever you use this type of data, the operation performed on that type of data will be atomic. What do you mean by atomic? Atomic means that static of the value, increment of the value, decrement of the value, anything that you do will be done in one shot without having any other process access to that variable. Okay? That is what atomic means. Okay? So we declare we use the mutex variable, right? And then, if you want to pass some attributes, which we generally don't need to, uh, so we would use the null value here. You would, uh, you know, declare your, you will initialize your mutex variable. Once you are done using the mutex, you need to destroy the mutex variable. So, this is more like doing malloc, allocating memory, initialization of the variable. So operating system internally is doing the malloc when you do the init. When you do destroy, you are basically freeing up this page. That is what we are doing. Right? So you have to use these two functions in order to use the mutex variable first. Now, once you have initialized the mutex variable, how do you use that? Is using these three functions. Right? Uh, mutex log. So whichever process wants to acquire a lock or whichever thread wants to acquire a lock, will it should be lock system call or function, right? Uh, you will see that it says that it is a locking call. What does it mean? It means that if one thread has initiated that function already and if the mutex is locked, right? And it then the second thread tries to call the same function. Now you can only acquire a lock once for a single mutant. You cannot acquire multiple locks on the same mutant. Which means when the second thread comes and tries to execute that code, it will be locked. Okay, it will be locked, meaning that that is the locking call. You once you once you have the second thread calling this function, you cannot execute any further code after that. Okay, that is what we call as locking code. If you don't want to use that locking call, there's another one called try lock. Okay? So try lock can be called by the second thread and it is not going to be locked, but if the mutex is already locked, then the function will return, but it will return an error code called TBZ. So the return code can be checked. And you can check if it is key easy. That means that the lock is already faced by another thread. And so this thread is not going to be locked, but it is going to be again, you know, after some time we can again try that. Okay, so that is how that mutex will work. And then once you're done using the mutex, you can use the unlock function to release the lock on the mutex. Okay? So these are the three functions that we can use for locking mechanism. Okay. So here is done, but as you all know, you always look at all these things structurally, right? How does it work? So I have two examples here. The first example is for the race condition that we have seen earlier. So we have Two 
function, as we know, is displaying a single character on the standard output device. Right? Single character on the standard output device. And you will see that there is another thread here. So in this thread, we are just displaying 0 to 9 continuously. In the second thread, we are displaying A to Z continuously. Right? So this is the two threads that we are executing and it is solving a common function. So we think is that since the locking mechanism is not used in the function, we are expecting a race condition when we execute the code. So let me start the virtual box. Okay, so let me execute that function. Thread uh, base condition without mutex. Right, so we are not using mutex here. We are not doing any locking. Right, so when we execute this code, as we have seen earlier, what happens is that the characters and the numbers are doubled up. Right, characters and the numbers are doubled up. Why? Because both the threads are accessing the same shared device, standard output, right? And both are trying to write using that, right? So this is the example where we have the race condition for standard output device using two threads. Now what we will do is we will implement the mutex, which is a locking mechanism. So if you look at the thread function, which we are calling, what we are doing is before the loop, right? Before the loop, we are saying lock the index, right? And of course, before using the index, you need to initialize that. Right? So we declare a variable, find index, and then that obviously is a global variable. It will be initialized using this function. And then when we get plus B again, in the thread function, you have the lock. Right? So when you lock just before the for loop, this for loop will be allowed to be executed only by a single thread. Are you getting the point? So one thread goes in to the function, it acquires the lock. Right. It acquires the lock. Now let's say the second thread also came into the function. It tries to acquire the lock in that mutex lock function, but it will not be able to acquire the lock because that mutex is already locked by another thread. Okay? So the first thread gets a lock, second thread is waiting. First thread executes the for loop, it then executes the unlock function. As soon as it does the unlock, the second thread will be able to acquire the lock. And then it will execute the form. So the point is only one thread is allowed to execute the for loop. And that for loop is what we call critical section code. Okay? For loop is what we call critical section code because it has the uh, device or some global variable which is being shared by multiple threads. Right? So critical section is something where the code has some global variable or some devices which are shared between the threads or processes which causes the race condition. And to avoid that race condition, we use the locking mechanism. So when I execute this code hundreds of times, you will never find that there is a generally lock the character. 
India because only one third is going to be allowed to do the follow. Otherwise, the second one will always have to wait. Okay. So this is how we can eliminate the race condition. Right, so if I execute hundreds of times, so only thing you will see is that in some case the numbers will be up and the characters are zero. Some days characters may be up and numbers are zero, but you will never find the jumbling together. You will never find that the characters and numbers are you know mixing mixed together in any scenario. Never. Because once one thread function finishes, then only the second thread All right. So now let's look at the problem with the mutex. Okay. So obviously, when we have the locking mechanism, you could have the problems here also. So one of the problems that you find is deadlock. Okay. How the deadlock can be caused? Let's say the same pair has a code in such a way that it is trying to lock the mutex two times from the same thread. Right? So before releasing the first one, second function may be called from the thread is again trying to lock the same mutex. So you end up in the deadlock situation there. Right? Uh, the second situation is what we call circular locking. Right? So in the case of circular locking, uh, basically your mutex 1 is locked by let's say thread 1 and then thread 2 is trying to lock mutex 1 okay. thread 2 has a lock on mutex 2 but then thread 3 is trying to lock the mutex 2 thread 3 has a lock on mutex 3 and thread 1 is trying to get a lock on mutex 3 so we can get a circular way and there's a circular way. If that happens again, you have a new uh, uh, you know, deadlock situation. So, obviously, one of the solution is apply the try lock function. Uh, there are other kind of problems that mutex cannot solve. Okay. So there are problems. Which are called reader writer problems or producer consumer problems. We can also call it as a producer consumer problem. So, in that case, uh, there may be multiple reads happening. Right? So, for example, uh, if you look at the operating system, in the operating system, we have a process table or a thread table. Right? Now, there may be multiple processes or multiple threads of the operating system trying to read that table. And there may be multiple processes trying to update that table. So it is basically a reader writer problem. Right? So you have multiple processes of thread trying to read the same table as well as trying to write. We cannot implement blocking mechanism using mutex for that. So there is a special type of block available for reader and writer, which we will look at next. Uh, there's another kind of problem which is called dynamic philosophical problem, which again I will come to that. Uh, again, this kind of problem cannot be solved using the mutex. So that is solved using another type of lock called semaphores. Okay. So I don't know if you have heard about the word called semaphores. Computer organization? Anyone? No? No? Okay. 
Okay. So, what is different between mutex and major hydro? So, if you have some entity where multiple process or multiple threads are trying to read, right? Multiple reads should be allowed, right? Because there is no problem. Remember, I told you that whenever you have two reads coming together, there is no issue. Whenever write and write and read are combined, that is when the issue comes. Right, so either read after write or write after read or write after write. If these three conditions are occurring, then you have an issue. Right? So we want to basically do mutual exclusion for that. So what happens is that multiple readers should be allowed to have a lock on mutants. Right? But in reality, mutants only can be locked once. Whether it is a reader process or writer process, it doesn't know. It doesn't know. So even if you are trying to read the same value, but if you apply a law on index, you can only get law once. You cannot get it multiple times. So again, the index will not work there. Right? So how do we do that? Second thing is, only one writer process should be allowed. Only one writer, not multiple writers. Or when there is a writer process has acquired the law, no other reader process also should be able to acquire the law. Because somebody is updating the table and the other person should not be able to read that table. Okay? So reader and write, reading and writing are mutually exclusive activities. Okay? Two reads, fine. Read and write, no. Right? Write and write, no. Right? So only one writer process should be allowed to acquire the law. Right? And as I said, Reading and writing are mutually exclusive. So that means when the reader lock is there, the writer should not be allowed. When the writer lock is there, reader should not be allowed. Okay. So these conditions have to be met. And therefore, the normal mutex lock does not work. So what do we do? We have a new type of lock, which is provided to us by the operating system. And that is actually called P thread underscore RW lock underscore P. That is the type of the lock we have. P thread underscore RW lock underscore P. This is the variable that we are initializing, right? Using P thread RW lock in it. Right? So again, you are just allocating the space here. Destroy will be reallocating the space. Right? When you look at the lock and unlock functions, now we have two lock functions, not just one. Right? We have the read lock function and we have the write lock function. Okay? So when the read lock function is issued by any thread, if there is already a write lock on that lock, then the read lock will go into the locking way. If there is already a read lock on this uh, variable, then the writer will go into the locking way. Right? If there is a reader lock already there, and if some other thread does the reader lock, then it will be able to lock again. So multiple read locks are allowed. Right? So if you if you have multiple threads issuing the RE lock multiple times, all of them will be successful. Okay? So that is the basic difference between this law and the mutex. Right? So this is this is the special law where we can do reading and writing activity together. So to show you an example, and and again, you know, you have the unlock and then you have the try lock functions also, similar to the mutex one. So to show you how this can be used, what example uh, you know, I've come up with is the activity on your linked list. So for example, we have a list which is being updated and which is being read. Okay? And maybe you are keeping track of some information there in the linked list. Uh, I hope everyone 
is familiar with this? Yes? Okay. Alright. So, if you see that function, that function has a printing of the values, right? So, this print head, right? So, we are just providing the head pointer and it is just going through the iteration of the uh, linked list and it is printing the all the we just look for that right so we are just starting from the head node and then we just print every element from that head node onwards all the way up to the null value right so that is what we are doing in the uh, print list and so in that case, we are acquiring the read log, right? Because we are just reading the linked list, right? Uh, now, you, if you see the main function, we have the this this function is called reader rw log, okay? And that function is called twice using two different threads. Okay, so there are two threads. Which are executing the read actually. Okay, so we are printing the list twice from two different text functions. And then there is a single thread which is executing the write function. And in the write function, I'm I think inserting data or something like that, deleting the data. Uh, in this case, we are just issuing the write block. So whenever you have a single shared uh, component, for example, let's say uh, you can take an example of like a producer consumer where you have a queue, right? One process is generating the data, putting it into the queue. Second process is trying to read the data from the queue. Right? That is why we call it as producer consumer problem. So any such problems that you may have, you can use read right now for that. So again, the output will not be interesting, but uh, you get an idea. So it's just trying to, you know, display all the linked list data and why it is trying to update it. So as I said, the output is not very uh, interesting, but uh, you know, understanding the code will basically, uh, you know, understand that how this read write lock works. Right. So. Producer consumer type of problems you can implement. So, in your operating system, only if you consider there are several examples of use cases for such uh, law, memory based table. Right? So, there is a whenever the memory is allocated by operating system to different processes, right? So, you have four segments, you have data segments, and each memory allocation for which it has to again maintain a list or a table, right? So, that is where you can use the user writer law. Uh, second area, process control blocks. Multiple threads will try to access the process control blocks for different information. Let's say reading of open files, right, or status of the process and so on. Right? So you can use again the locking mechanism there. Uh, kernel thread table, if you have KLT that you are using in your system, kernel has thread table inside as I mentioned earlier. Multiple threads may try to access the same thread table. Okay, so when you can use reader writer loss there. So kernel will be implementing reader writer loss or accessing the thread table. Okay, so any shared resource that you may have, right, in your system, you can use reader writer loss. Any questions? <coughs> okay, so you guys can do certain things. Reader writer loss into certain things. But still, there are certain other things 
that is not possible even by these two types of laws. Okay. Uh, one of the example is very famous example generally given in most of the operating system rules is called Dani philosophical problem. Okay. What is the Dani philosophical problem? Basically, the point is that there are five philosophers or n number of philosophers here, and then there's a four here, right? Each of the philosopher has four four chopstick or whatever, right, next to the food. Now the point is, if this guy wants to eat, needs more of these, needs more of this. Similarly, when this guy wants to eat, needs more of these. So these are the resources that are required to be consumed by this philosopher if that person wants to eat a food. Okay. So you have a resource and you have the process or you know some friend who is consuming that resource, who wants to consume that resource. And but here it is not in the fixed format of mutex or redirect. So here you are not saying that multiple people can read. Multiple people can write or not. Right? So that that concept does not come here. It is the concept is number of resources and the number of uh, consumers, right? Who is going to be consuming the that resource? So for this kind of things, we have a special law again called semaphores. Okay, semaphores. Uh, I'll give you an example of the real example. Let's say. Let's say that in our system, we have four USB ports. For example, I have four USB ports. Right? Now, n number of processes wants to access the USB port. Right? How does the operating system maintain which process has access to which USB port? Or how many ports are available to be uh, locked? So you have a resource of USB port. Right? And then you have the kind of processes trying to access that resource. Right? So you use the semaphore and say that okay, you have access to four resource and you have n number of process which will then access the resource using semaphore. Okay? So okay, if we if we take a look at an example, it will be uh, clear to you. So there are two types of operation that we normally perform on the semaphores. One is called wait, the other one is called signal. <coughs> uh, the wait is going to be basically reducing the value of semaphore and the signal is going to be incrementing the value of semaphore. Okay? So it means that when you are acquiring the lock, this means you are reducing the lock. Okay? But you have n number of locks. You don't have one lock, you have n number of locks. Right? So in mutex you just have a single lock. Here you have n number of locks. So for example, again if I go back to the USB example, four USB ports, you can acquire four locks on that USB resource. Okay? So that is why we have this counting thing. Okay? <coughs> so semaphores can be used again as a Binary semaphore or a counting semaphore. When you say binary semaphore, it is same as mutex. So mutex is an equivalent of binary semaphore, which means you can have a single lock and single reads. That's all. Single lock, single unlock. Right? That's a binary semaphore. Counting semaphore is the one which is you know more evident, more useful because we can share the resources. Right? So as I said. Processes can be sharing with processor. We have six ports on your system. Let's say. Which port is available to which processor? How do you know that? Or how many ports are available? How do you know that? So operating system has to keep track, right? The down. You can use several ports for that. Multiple network devices. Forces sharing with class, whatever. Any shared resource that you have, n number of shared resources, shared by M number of processes can be using the semaphores. <coughs> so I think binary semaphore is simple. Uh, it's like mutex. We just lock once and then we release once and that's it. Um, 
let me actually take you to the actual example later. So, for example, this is how we visualize the chemical. Okay. Right? Uh, so, this is the chemical. Okay. Right? Uh, you have three parameters. The first parameter is the variable, the semaphore variable. Uh, just forget about the second parameter for now. Third parameter is the value with which you want to initialize the semaphore. Okay, so as I mentioned, semaphore can have multiple blocks. Right, so that means value can be 5, can be 10, can be 1, depending on how many resources you want to lock using semaphore. Okay, so that is why we are calling it, calling it as a counting semaphore. Right? So if I say 5, I can increment 5 times and increment 5 times. That means I have 5 resources which I want to control using that semaphore. That is what I am doing. Second parameter, which we call P shared. Uh, that parameter is normally, see, we know that processes do not share data area. Right? It has its own data area. But if you want to share semaphore between the processes, there is a special memory allocation that the operating system will do for sharing only that part of the memory between the two processes using that second parameter. That is why P shared. Really. So again, if you don't understand, don't worry about it because that is not something that uh, you know, we'll be using in this specific course. But you should know that there is a way where you can share the memory between the processes, especially using this variable. Right? Uh, and then you can destroy the you can destroy the same code once you're done with it, right? So for the operating system, instead of signal, they have given the method called post. So post will increment the value of semaphore and wait will decrement the value of semaphore. Okay. So let us take an example of semaphore first. So in this example, I'm using semaphore as more like mutex, uh, but I just wanted to give you an idea as to how we initialize that semaphore and how we use that. Uh, so what we have done is that we have used this uh, variable called semaphore, which is our semaphore, and then it, it is initialized with the value of one, which means I'm saying that there is only one resource that I have, which I want to get to lock on. <coughs> In the main function, we have a single thread function, which is being called. And <clears throat> what we are doing is we are basically either getting access to the standard out device using uh, either thread function or using the main thread. So between the main thread and the thread function, the semaphore is locked. So for example, if you see here, right, uh, unless you press any key, the semaphore is available to the thread function. So thread function will be able to get log on semaphore. It will be able to keep on printing that message, right? Uh, and then it will read again in the next iteration, it will keep on displaying the message. As soon as I press the key here, the semaphore will keep on displaying the message.
fact, semaphore. So until I press any key, the red function will keep on displaying this, right? Uh, once I press a key, now the main thread got a lock. The main thread got a lock. So because the main thread has a lock, the child thread is not able to operate a lock on the server. And so child thread is not executed. It's not displayed that message. Okay. So currently the lock is with the main thread. Again, I press a key. The thread, uh, the lock from the main thread is released, and again the child thread is able to acquire the lock. So this is again similar to mutex because I'm just using a single uh, value for semaphore. But the next example that I'll show you will be for multiple resources, multiple semaphores. So let us assume that we have two global variables, I and J. They are the shared resources. Okay. And then I have two functions, function one, function two. They are using both shared resources, i and j variables. Okay. So in function 1, <coughs> we are implementing or adding the value of 2 to i. And in function 2, we are adding value of 2 or whatever, to uh, j. And we want these functions to be executed by multiple threads. So we have four threads. The first two threads are executing function 1. The third and fourth thread is executing function 2. Okay. Which means that when you execute these two threads, they will be competing for the shared variable i. When we use these two threads, they will be competing for shared variable j. Okay. So what I'm, the example that we are showing you here is we have two shared resources, but you can use multiple threads to share those resources as well, right? So, uh, like for example, you just report a network interface, right? Ethernet port. You can have those two shared resources can be shared with the multiple process. That is the kind of example that we have from here, right? So, uh, so using this, basically I want to show you an example that these two threads are accessing, accessing I variable at the same time. These two are accessing the variable at the same time, which are the uh, global variables. And so, for accessing those variables, we are trying to get a lock before incrementing the value. And then after incrementing the value also, we are releasing the lock. So that is what we are doing. So let's say if we have USB port access or something or network port access, that is what the code you will do here. Right. So, in case if you were trying to do something or something with the USB port, you will be putting that code over there. That will be your shared resource. Right. So, that is the kind of code that you can use with the semaphore. Now, let me. Show you this code um, and. I'll not try to explain this code here, but I would want you guys to take a look at this code uh, before the next class. And I'll explain maybe in the next class, or if you have already understood the code, then you want to explain how the code works. Right? So, what this code is, is actual implementation of the dynamic filter of the so I'll give you just a brief idea. <coughs> so philosophers have three states. Hungry state, uh, sorry, uh, thinking state, and eating state. Okay. So hungry, thinking, and eating. Those three states we have. And <coughs> we have the put fork and take fork functions right so that is where we are ensuring that if one philosopher takes the fork one of them on the left side actually 
to say to not suffer should be able to say the four from the right side. If that to not suffer does not have access to the four from both sides, that to not suffer will not be able to lock any one of them. So we are making sure that both are available or none are available. That is what we are making sure it is. Uh, in, in the put four can be uh, take four example. Uh, this is loop for all the five philosophers. So as you can see, they are doing take four can put four, uh, <clears throat> and then this is where the initialization and the uh, thread creation is happening. So each thread is each philosopher. Each thread is each philosopher, and each philosopher has the same thinking. Only. So whenever a philosopher is hungry, that philosopher should be able to take two quotes. If that philosopher is not able to take two quotes, then it has to wait until someone releases either the left or the right hand side of the quote. As soon as that person releases it, then this person will be able to take more quotes. So that is the quote what one is doing in essence. But I want you to go through the quote and try and understand yourself. Because I can explain, but if you work for it, you will be able to better understand. Okay. If you are in doubt, definitely we will discuss in the next lecture. Right? Okay, so I think that was the last slide on the uh, concurrency control. Any questions? On the any environment, how does heads work? How is it different from process? How does the lucky work? Yes. How does only one four can do multiple things? Yeah. Right. So, uh, so if I had mentioned that uh, it would do time blessing as what the uh, marker. Try to okay. So basically, what will happen is uh, each of the core will be assigned certain amount of time, so let's assume that each core has this time slide. 0, 5 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, 15 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, and so on. Right? Now, let us say that you have five threads that you want to execute. Right? <clears throat> and let's say you have two cores. So you have C1 and C2. So at let's say time 0, you get P1 and P2 here. Right? So thread 1 is allocated to port 1, thread 2 is allocated to port 2. Once the first column and second are over, which is your context switch time, right? Your context switch time. Then the operating system will say that, okay, you guys are done, you need to context switch. So the ports will be unallocated. Those threads, status will be saved. So PSW, step pointer, and step will go into the memory, right? Uh, aside. And then the next two threads will be allocated to the same two course, right? So let's say here P3 and P4 will come. Again, time is done. So now let's say P5 will come and 
let's assume that p2 comes right so now p5 is allocated to core 1 this 2 is reallocated to core 2 so again it is not always necessary that whichever thread was running in whichever core in the previous time the same core will be allocated to the same thread it's not always like that you can have different thread going to different cores depending on the availability does, does that make sense Only after? No, no. It is not. See, if the thread is completed, then there is no need to allocate T two to four two again, no. Right? There is no need to allocate two. So what I am trying to say is that it will. Let's let's say now here. <coughs> let us say here, T uh, two is complete now. Okay. If P two is completed here, then uh, let's say P one goes here and P three goes here. So whenever the thread is completed, that does not require any allocation to the core. But let's say uh, you know in this case, uh, let's say P one is taking twenty five milliseconds. So every time when there is a time to allocate. Thread T1 to 4, right? So you let's say you know the first time it took five milliseconds, second time it took five more milliseconds. So like that, it will continue kept on allocated for 25 milliseconds, and then the thread will be completed. Okay, understood? Any other question? Okay. So let me briefly start with the next chapter. Have you guys studied networking before? No? Uh, Are you aware of IP Internet Protocol, IP address? Maybe briefly, little bit. Okay. So I know that uh, you are not studying networking. So what I am going to do is I am also going to uh, teach theory part of the networking a little bit because otherwise we won't be able to do the program. In order to do the programming, you have to understand the theory first. Right? So first, I will go through the theory of networking area. Uh, and of course, I think you do have computer networks in the uh, six semester or six semester, right? Yes. Yeah, we're going to get close to it. So what is what is a network, right? How how does how does network work? How does internet works? How does the applications on the cloud work? How does your database work? Everything, all the all the applications that we use which are using the network is using these sensors. Everything. Right? So most of the application that we use works in what we call client server model. Client server model. Right? So client is something which is trying to access some resource and the server has the resource. So for example, if you are using a database, then a database server has the resource which is in form of database, and then the client is filing the query, SQL query, right? Trying to access that resource. Did you study database? No. And yes, you're not using those sensors. Uh, you obviously use web pages. Right? You're using websites. Here's your website. Right? You go to the campus portal. Right? So the campus portal has a data and you see your grades, you see the courses that are allocated to you and all that. So there are all resources. Which is with me? Web server. 
which is housed in Nestor surrounding town. So basically the resources that you have are managed by the server and the clients are accessing that resource over the network. That is basically what we are doing, right? So server is the process with one or uh, that that can have one or more clients. Uh, server will be managing the resources. Server provides the services to the client, right? And then the server is activated by the request from the client. So uh, the client will be requesting something to the server. Server will handle the request, will be responding to the clients, and then the client will be handling the responses. This is generally how all the network based communication work. So, in the computer network area, uh, you could have different types of network depending on the uh, geographical location in a way. Okay? Uh, these days, there are more buzzwords also there. Uh, for example, PAN is another type of uh, network. Personal area network. Okay, so personal area network is your phone, router, you know, your, your laptop that you may be using at your home. Okay, so you have a small router at your home and you connect to all devices in it. And okay, so they, they call it as personal area network. In the range of maybe 10, 15, 20 meters range. Okay, uh, you could have a system area network uh, or a storage area network. Then you could have multiple CPU racks and multiple storage racks. So multiple disks are there and multiple processor racks are there. They are all connected together in a single system. And that is called system area network or storage area network. You have a LAN, local area network. Generally, local area network refers to something that is like any campus wide or a building point. Okay, so within a building, all the devices are connected, right? So that, is, for example, everything in CP building is connected to a single network. Right? Everything in the lab building will be connected to a single network. So that is what we generally call it as local area network. Okay? One area network cross the city boundary, country ground boundary, and so on. Right? So whenever you want to connect from, let's say, some location from here to, uh, let's say, Mumbai, you know, in South somewhere, or even across the uh, mountain, right? Uh, when, you go, when you want to go beyond the uh, country, right? So all of that generally comes under by area. <laughs> internet is generally used to refer earlier as internet network. Now for short, we use uh, internet. All the devices that are connected to internet is generally what we call host. HOST host. Hosts are all the devices which are connected to the network. Internet. Okay. And uh, internet has a global address. Global address. So every single device. So for example, how do we know where each one of each one of us lives? Right? There has to be unique address. Unique address. Right? Your address cannot be same as mine. Otherwise, how would we identify that you know this is a different person and this is a different person? Right? So you have to have a unique address. So every single host, billions of devices that are connected on the network, they all have one unique address, IP address. Internet protocol address. Okay, IP stands for Internet Protocol Address. Okay. So, IP address is always unique for all the devices that are connected on the Internet. Now, how the Internet was built? Or how is the Internet built? Right? Uh, so, as I mentioned, you know, there is a proximity where the devices are connected. So, in the small proximity, you have uh, let's say in this room only few devices are connected. Then you get four devices connected between this room and the other room or the building, other building, and so on, right? So depending on the size of the area, there are different devices that need to be used. 
different devices that we see. Uh, the first smallest device that generally we use is called hubs. Uh, nowadays, nobody generally uses hub. Everything is router because router takes care of hub also. Uh, but in older times, uh, you know, you used to you used to use hub, and hub usually stands in the room or in the floor on the building. It basically works at what we call the internet address level or a MAC address level. In the name of the address that we use is for MAC address. MAC address. And it is this uh, 16 byte value. 16 byte value. Each of your computer will also have the MAC address. And uh, you can actually take a look at it. Uh, so, for example, on the Windows machine, if you run a command ipconfig all, <laughs> whatever you see as a physical address here, these physical address are nothing but the MAC address. So every single network device that you have on your computer, on your mobile phone, every single one of them has a separate MAC address. So for example, your Bluetooth will have a MAC address. Your Ethernet port will have a MAC address. Your USB port will have a MAC address. So every single network port that you have on your system, every single one of them will have a MAC address. And that is the physical level uh, address that we have. <clears throat> then, once you span across the room and then go to the mailing level, then you have something called as bridge. So what bridge was doing, it was connecting multiple hubs, multiple hubs to go across the buildings. And so, Again, okay, in the olden times, we used to use other bridges. Nowadays, everything is replaced with the routers. And then finally, there was a router. Okay. Uh, now, the function of grid and a lot of time is done by router. So, the function of router is to connect multiple LANs or multiple local area networks into a wide area. So, let's say if you want to connect from here to uh, let's say Google's IP. Right now the Google server may be located in Singapore. Okay. When you try to access Google.com, then you are trying to access actually the server which is sitting in Singapore. So how are you able to connect to that server from here? Right? So every uh, area will have a local area. So for example, Ahmedabad, there will be a local area here. From Ahmedabad, you will be connecting to, let's say, Mumbai. They will have a local area. So there will be a hop or connection between Ahmedabad and Mumbai. Right? And then from there, uh, you will go over the ocean and connect to Singapore. Right? So every single segment will have a local network. And then each of those like, local network is then connected via uh, Okay. So now is not only used within the uh, home. But it is used across the country also, connecting different networks across the country, across the city also. Okay. Uh, you can have different connection type also. For example, if you connect from your mobile phone, right, you could use the Wi-Fi, or you could use your regular 4G or 5G connection. Right? So uh, each of them may have this different so you could connect using Ethernet, you could connect using Wi-Fi, you could connect using your 4G network and all that, right? So each one of them will have a different type of connection. And the router is the only device which is able to understand all this. Okay? How many bridges they will not be able to understand those differences? And therefore, generally now we are not using them. Right? Router is the one which is able to understand, so we are using them. Uh, 
Uh, I think this particular slide I can skip because you don't really have to know this uh, for programming part. <coughs> Let me just cover this slide and uh, maybe one more slide. Just to give a basic idea and then uh, I'll stop. So, uh, whenever you use internet, right, there are two types of uh, technology that is used. One which you are familiar with, which is called internet protocol. Basically what happens is when, when I'm connecting to let's say Google server, I'm sending the data to Google server and Google server is responding to me with that data. Now whatever the data I'm sending, right, maybe that data is uh, 10 kilobyte data. Okay? But at the time, I'm only allowed to send let's say 1 kilobyte of data, which means I have to divide that 10 kilobyte data into 10 different packets, 10 different buckets. And those 10 buckets, each of them will have to go to the Google server. Now, it is not compulsory that each of those packets will be reaching Google server one after the other in sequence. Because each of those packets may go to different routes. Let's say one goes from here to US and then comes to Singapore. Other one may go to Europe and then comes to Singapore. Other one may just go to the south and go to Singapore, whatever. So it is not compulsory that each packet will follow exactly the same route. Right? Which means it is possible that some packets may get lost, some packets may get duplicated. Right? So the receiving end will have to ensure that all of these packets are collected and a single 10k data is on. Okay. So sending the packet, sending the individual packet of one k is done by IT, Internet Protocol. Okay. But you need a layer about that to ensure that all the packets are received and they are received in a particular sequence. Combine them in a particular sequence. Okay, that is one level above. And that is done by TCP. So, in the internet, you have two types of protocols that is used internet protocol, and then the second type of protocol, which we call transport layer protocol. Transport layer. Okay, so transport layer is the one which is Enjoying the hand checking between the two sides. Okay? Hand checking between the two sides. IP level is just concerned about sending the data, that's all. So, combining those two, we are able to then send and receive the actual messages, whether it is large or small. Okay? So, uh, this is how usually we And I just put this picture so you understand how basically so let's say you have a client which is creating the transport layer packet. It is then sending it to the IP layer. IP layer is actually sending the data to the internet outside, right, of your building. Someone is taking the data and sending it to the right place. Let's say this is your server side. The server side takes in the data. Again, this data is collected in the IP layer, collected by the transport layer, and then sent it to the server. So this is every single time that you are trying to access any of the server on the website, this route is being taken. Right? And the response then will come from there to here. Okay, so every single time that is what is happening. Okay. Uh, so let me just stop here. I think uh, We'll, we'll continue in the next lecture. Any questions? No? Fast Sir, how is IP oh. unreliable? Okay. Thank you.